and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anna Makbul, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be talking about two stories. The first is with reference to Aradanti Roy's interview that she has given to Karan Thapar, and she has talked about the situation uh, that the Indian democracy is in at the moment. She's com commented on various issues uh, with regards to Modi regime um, and the fascist ideology that is being um, uh, propagated in the country at the moment. Uh, the situation of human rights uh, also made references to the situation in Kashmir and the rights of the Kashmiri people. Uh, she has, as usual, spoken openly about the state of affairs that uh, that uh, currently exists in India at the moment. Um, and she has talked very courageously about what is wrong uh, with the way, uh, the direction that India has taken. But she is also hopeful that the Indian people will rise against this. Um, and there is hope uh, that something good is going to come out of it. And the people of India will resist to what is going on in India at the moment. Uh, something which, of course, is bleak but if the hope is there we hope that there's a lot uh, more that we can see coming on uh, in front of what is happening in within India and then of course saner voices like Roy uh, who come and uh, speak with a lot of courage because of course this as we all know is hugely discouraged in India um, and has its consequences as well we'll discuss her comments in further detail in the show uh, and try to understand and look at her perspective um, and and of course the situation in India at the moment with reference to uh, Modi's ideology and the human rights situation, also the kind of situation that currently exists in Kashmir. We will also be looking at the visit of the Iranian interior minister to Pakistan, a day-long visit in which um, he is going to be meeting with the top government authorities, also including the Prime Minister Imran Khan. A high-level delegation meeting has already taken place as well, in which various issues have come under discussion uh, with regards to uh, border management, uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, um, and of course, uh, co uh, the uh, stability of Afghanistan, which is very important to peace and stability in the region as well. Um, exchange of prisoners and better border management has also come under discussion. Um, and of course, uh, it's important to mention that these visits um, have further, further significance. Uh, as we all know that in the recent past, uh, Balochistan province has experienced terrorist attacks as well. And there has been evidence coming out of um, territory and soil outside of Pakistan being used against it as well. Uh, and we want to be able to factor in all those efforts as well and to, of course, boost our bilateral relationship with Iran. So we'll discuss the, this particular visit in further detail, uh, the kind of issues that need to be pointed out, uh, and then, of course, the outcome of this visit. With the stu in the studios with me is Farooq Badafi and Raja Faisal. And on Skype, I have been joined by Dr. John Dial, who's a writer and activist. Thank you very much, Mr. John Dial, for being with us in the debate. I'll start with you, John. With reference to what Arandati Roy has spoken about in her recent interview, uh, she has in the past also spoken freely and openly about what the situation is currently in India. Um, however, we also understand um, that it takes a lot of courage to speak like that on Indian media now uh, or even raise your voice as being part of uh, the community that at the moment, uh, because of course there's so many consequences of such actions as well. Um, you of course um, have also done the same on numerous occasions. When we see uh, these people coming out and raising their voice, how important first of all and how significant it is in terms of the hope that Arundhati Roy also speaks about um, when people uh, will hopefully actually resist um, and bring forth a change in India that is much needed. Oh, I'm not as good a writer as Arundhati is, certainly, certainly not as famous. But we may use different physiology, different terminology, but we speak the same thing. And we speak not just from our experience of the present, but from a larger historical experience of the last 50 years. In my case, I've been a journalist 52 years. And we saw how the Indian public had the capacity, the tenacity, and the strength to reverse the course of, of politics. This happened with Mrs. Indira Gandhi. She imposed the emergency. 20 months later, 22 months later, she had to withdraw it. She was defeated. And then they chose her again after a second set of elections. The people of India, when they want to act in concert, when, as they say in both our countries, when the water crosses the nostrils, they act, and they act decisively. I think the water is rising steadily. It has not yet crossed the nose. But the day it does, you will see 
that in the next general election, they will speak. In the current elections which are on, and an election in the state of Uttar Pradesh is like a mini general election. You know, the biggest voting publics in the world. And just now we've had a phase and a half of elections there, and today there were elections in two different states. These elections themselves will give an index. If Mr. Modi doesn't win with the sort of majority that he wants to, and he hasn't won so in the previous several elections, he didn't win outright in Maharashtra, for instance. Mm -hmm. He lost in West Bengal decisively. It was routed. Right. Let so us, let there are signs. Go on to a clip uh, from the interview that Roy has given, and we'll come back and continue our discussion. Now you have these institutions of democracy, whether it's uh, you know the press, whether it's the courts, whether it's the intelligence services, worryingly even the army, all institu educational institutions penetrated, overtaken, or at least compromised by this Hindu nationalist ideology. You have parliament turned into, uh, you know, monkey bath. We have always been a brutal country. <laughs> you know, we're not becoming, we have always been a brutal country. There has not been a day when the Indian army, since independence, when the Indian army has not been, let's say, deployed against its own people, whether it's in the Northeast, whether it's in Kashmir, Hyderabad, Go, you know. Also, any country that practices caste in the way we do is a brutal country, because that is a brutal hierarchy that can only be kept in place by the permanent threat of violence Well, you heard what Roy was talking about. And Farouk, this is something that we have spoken about so many times in the past, yeah. the state of affairs. Um, and she highlights it very well, what really has been going on for a while in India. Right, absolutely. And uh, I want to actually comment on this as well, but that can wait. Uh, Sana, I actually had a question for Dr. Dayal. Dr. Dayal, uh, a fan here. Uh, I just uh, was looking at uh, what you said and what she was also saying. Uh, you know, clarity of vision in the face of adversity or uh, existential challenges, perhaps the hallmark of a genius. I can see that you also possess that. But uh, there is a concern that I keep on looking at the Western, uh, sorry, Indian media, the discourse there, and it keeps on haunting me. Uh, I understand that there is a tendency of uh, seeking solace in the past example that if we did it in the past, perhaps we can do it again. Uh, on the other side, we keep on seeing our election after election, BJP gaining more strength rather than weakening. Mm -hmm. On the other side, when you look at this very interview, sir, uh, in which Karan Thapar is interviewing her, I felt distinct, uh, I got, got this distinct sensation that the gentleman was actually laundering soft Hindutva himself. The way he was nonplussed by the comments on Kashmir, hmm. uh, by the future possibility of future breaking down and similar things. Do you think that in that situation there is still a reset button, some uh, you know, avenue for hope at all, sir? Uh, you know, and when he tried to do so, Arundhati said, stop being ridiculous, Karan. She did say that, and to his face, and to his discomfiture. I would not entirely agree with you that he was trying to be soft in Dutva. That is his style, and, and, and let's remember that he is the one journalist who did challenge and embarrass the hell out of Mr. Modi a long time ago, but he did that, and is quite capable of doing that again. and does it on a daily basis with a lot of important BJP people. So I, I would not put much store in calling Karan a soft Hindutva. I would be very worried on something else that Arundhati said. It is the state of affairs in the institutions, parliament, where discussion doesn't take place, the police, which is highly polarized, the judiciary, where we don't know which bench would give which judgment. On, on alternate days, they seem to confuse us. And yet, we have to say that our hope lies with the Indian judiciary. And today, for instance, if you were to listen to the discourse in the Karnataka High Court, the defense counsels, both of them, made very strong, very cogent appeals on the issue of why the state is going to the brink on the issue of the hijab. And, and, and that was very strong. And you could see on the bench, 
one judge was wishy washy, the other judge was quite straight. And, and I take, I mean, what else can we do? As I said, we clutch at straws and we pick up signals from these things. The also, while we know that a large chunk of people, the youth and so on and so forth, have been galvanized in support of a ban on hijab, and yet women, Hindu women largely, and others, academics, students, a chunk of journalists are speaking for the right of the girl. Whether she wants to wear a hijab, that's a right. Whether she does not want to wear a hijab, like Sana is not wearing a hijab, that's also a right. And then to keep the discourse on the education of Muslim women, the fact that this discourse takes place in the face of all that aggression is something that I hold on to. Otherwise, in depression, what do we do? We can't commit suicide a mass. Uh, Dr. Dayal, uh, uh, very recently, uh, uh, obviously Rahul Gandhi, he highlighted the fact that uh, the idea of India, uh, you know, having uh, so many states getting together and creating India is uh, entirely based on uh, secularism. And the secularism of India is the one that is keeping all of the states uh, together and make India. Uh, and if uh, we go through this interview, the points which are highlighted by Arundhati Roy, uh, she categorically said that different institutions are getting penetrated by uh, the you know hardliners, uh, the extremist ideology like Hindutva ideology. In other words, if we if we call it saffronization of different institutions, the key institutions. Now, uh, do you think that uh, a powerful institution like Indian Army, we might see so far, it has been, you know, uh, portraying itself uh, when it comes to within India. I'm not talking about Kashmir, but in, within India, it portrays itself as an, uh, uh, you know, very professional institution, secular. Uh, a secular institution, I must say. And uh, I just wanted to know from you, if in coming future, as Arundhati Roy has predicted, if it does take place that few of the generals, they are saffronized and they come up on the top positions within Indian Army, would it be a huge worry for India? And could we see that the idea of India would, of course, uh, you know, uh, it won't be a secular India anymore and it might see uh, a disband. I, I just wanted to use uh, a word, balkanization, which is, uh, you know, always talked about. What would you say about this, sir? Look, the idea of India is based, to begin with, on federalism. And then comes secularism, which is one of the binding forces. And federalism itself imp implies a lot of other things. It implies a devolution of powers. It implies economic devolution. It also implies, in its own way, the fact that the Indian army is not monolithic recruitment from one region or even one religion, although as a majority religion, it finds a representation. It's a pretty large chunk of Sikhs. There are other people. There's a whole lot of people from South, South India, from Tamil Nadu, from the two Telugu speaking states of Andhra Pradesh, from Kerala, from Maharashtra. There are Dalits from Maharashtra called the Mahar Regiment. There's a Sikh light infantry from the Punjab, which is the Dalits of the Sikh community. So the construct the, the demographic construct, the sociological construct of the Indian army is very different. And, and therefore, and of course, it's sown to the constitutional freedom and it's sown to obey the civilian government to that extent. But it happened not too far in the distant past. And the army made it clear, as indeed did the American army, that they are sown to protect the constitution of India and through it, the borders of India. So I would personally, no, I, I would be more worried of police forces in states, mm. because that recruitment is from a very limited area. And the BGP, for instance, in Madhya Pradesh has been practically ruling for 30 years. You can imagine the constables that they've recruited all these years, that they would be Sorry, molded. Mr. Mr. Dayal, let, us, let us go to another, another clip from the interview and we'll be back with more discussions. The demonization, the otherization of the Muslim community, you saw that sort of genocidal language during the corona lockdown where Tablighi Jamaat was blamed for you know, spreading typhus. Muslims were spitting on fruit and uh, sorry, spreading corona, just like the Nazis blamed the, the Jews for, for spreading typhus. But 
Then you had something like the National Register of Citizens and the Citizenship Amendment Act, where, you know, again, like the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, citizens were expected to produce legacy papers which would be approved by the state, which would then grant you citizenship. Now, this sort of, like Hannah Arendt said, you know, citizenship is the right to have rights. So when you shake that ground under people's feet, uh, it's a terribly, terrible thing to do regardless of who is on the list and who is off the list. Mr. Dayal, with reference to what we were talking about earlier, you spoke about how um, there, of course, is a possibility and the hope that people are going to resist uh, and there is going to be change. And this is what Roy also speaks about. Uh, but when we see that institutions themselves um, um, are so corrupted by this ideology um, and you don't really have a democratic system in its essence, um, what really is the mechanism or the way forward in terms of bringing about change? And are the inner voices actually mobilizing the people in some way or the other? How are you even penetrating um, the, the people who have had a certain mindset? Uh, because of course, there's so much uh, that is being inculcated through media, through the political influences, through our, the leaders in India, um, that it seems hard uh, for, for more than just the like-minded people uh, to be able to bring that change. Right, and uh, with your permission, Sanal, let hmm. me add to this question because uh, uh, I keep on following India's politics, uh, uh, Dr. Dayal, and I saw a very insightful comment from KCR, the famous, uh, famous politician criticizing Hindutva. Uh, similarly, uh, CM Stalin and Mamta Banerjee are also going to m meet, perhaps because of the bureaucratic changes that are coming in. Uh, the question at this moment is we seem to find that in India's past there was a third option that was Tisra uh, uh, Mocha. Um, is there a possibility that all these regional parties can come together and uh, uh, actually challenge BJP the way it should be done? And secondly, when you are looking at all these changes, they are essentially cultural, right, in mm -hmm. India. Uh, but they are actually riding on the back of politics. Hmm. So at this moment, is it because of the inequality in the society or because of the casteism that they are managing to get away with the uh, murder and everything, sir? The violence in India is caste. Ambedkar was very clear on it, even before independence. Caste teaches us how to be violent, as Arundhati said, how to, how to subjugate people, how to kill the Dalit, how to rape. The women. So the lessons come from there. But communism, please let us do remember, Mr. Modi came to power, riding a very vicious campaign in 2013, 2014, but he came to power through a democratic election, a bad, vicious, vitiated election, but an election nonetheless. And in 2019, he again came to power, losing state assemblies by the half dozen and very important state assemblies. But the parliamentary seats, he did win. So one thing is quite clear. Regime change in India can only be through the electoral process, through the next general election, which is due in two years. And the election in Uttar Pradesh is quite a curtain raiser for that. So you can also imagine how vicious the campaign is. Is there something being done to change that? I beg your pardon? What about public opinion? Is there something being done to change that? Precisely. So when we see a dharam panchayat at Hadwar, which calls for a genocide of Muslims and Christians, when we see that, the people are alarmed. The courts are alarmed. Even the president of India, who is a BJP man, is alarmed. Today his nephew left the BJP party and joined somebody else. So there is an element of alarm when Mr. Modi, Mr. Yogi and others take their pitch to talking about genocide and disenfranchisement and second class, using the language of the RSS, which was there even before independence. So when it comes to that, people are roused today. The main movement in society, the halchal, you have Admiral Ramdas singing of unity. Is it? Yeah, Dr. 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 Dayal. Uh, very quickly, sir, uh, yeah. just uh, regarding uh, the forces that were there before freedom, uh, there's Hindu Mahasabha also, right? And there seems to be something very eerie that went on while Delhi uh, violence was going on. It was a competition to the bottom. 
uh, it was a competition between RSS and Hindu Masba and others. Do you think that there is a possibility that all these elements redesign the entire country and then there is hardly any space left for the moderate voices at all? No, I was, I was talking to you of that. The fact that they will do that makes common sense. If they want to win, if they want to make India into a Hindu Rashtra, they have to do exactly what you're saying. They have to join forces, try to divide people further, try to sow divides between Hindu various communities. They will try all that. And that is the challenge to the rest of civil society. And that is what Arun Titanoy was talking of. And I am telling you that people are rising to the challenge. The women are rising to the challenge. The youth are rising to the challenge. The, 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 today, the consolidation of agenda on the issue of the hijab is phenomenal, I tell you. It's phenomenal. And, and, and that gives us a little hope for, a little hope, really, that we will see some change. Maybe not in 2000. 24, as she said, but the process, Mr. Modi's, as they say, his face shows that he sees the writing on the wall. And that, in, that explains the sharpness and the pitch of his rhetoric. Hmm. So, Dr. Dayal, you have rightly pointed out that there are, there are sane voices as yourself as well, who are, uh, you know, coming uh, on every platform and uh, talking about it. And you have earlier mentioned about that, uh, you know, Modi, he came into power through, uh, obviously, democratically, he was elected. So don't you think that it is uh, a bigger worry that uh, democracy in uh, India is electing people uh, such uh, of, of, uh, of the Modi kind? And uh, if we look at uh, today's India, if today's India is electing such type of people, this should be a bigger worry because uh, today's India is having a majority of the people who is actually supporting these kind of ideas. Don't you think that it is more alarming to have uh, uh, such type of uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, democratic rule in which uh, people like Modi are coming up? No, the, the question you should have asked me was, do you trust in the election commission? Because more than the Supreme Court, more than the High Court, more than anything else, the election commission's neutrality has been questioned. The EVMs have been questioned by hundreds of retired IS officers, scores of former election commissioners. They are questioning, is the chief election commissioner today acting as a lackey or is he trying to be the neutral person he's constitutionally required to be? That remains a big worry. But even there, I'm sure corrections will take place because eventually each polling booth with a thousand votes, each polling agent, each returning officer is sovereign for that particular moment. And there is hope in that. It will not be possible. I also told you about the political demography of India. Tamil Nadu is culturally so different from the North. The Andhra is so different. Maharashtra is so different. And that is the federalism of India, which is its strength. The variety of people we have here. The North Indian, just now they're talking of the uh, uh, uni universal civil court. This is a, a, a joke, because in North India, you'll be lynched if you were to marry in your niece. In Tamil Nadu, that is the most desired of all consummations. So the cultural variation of the country counterbalances each other. And that was what Nehru spoke of when he talked about the federalism. It has an ability, a built-in ability, for various contradictory forces to neutralize themselves and to channel their energies. And I think we must, we have to ultimately, like any other country in the world, put our faith in something. And the democratic process, and people like me and you and everybody else in the world must work to go to every country in the world towards Absolutely. strengthening the democratic process. Right. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. John Dale, much. for being with Thank us. You um, much, we admire your courage and truly respect your in-depth understanding of the situation. Thank you very much for being Thank on the debate, much. sir. With regards to what they are, Mr. Dayal spoke about, and then, of course, uh, what Roy said in her interview, Farooq, I'm still trying to understand whether or not these voices actually have the reach and access uh, to people's minds the way that they have been corrupted uh, in terms of bringing about that change. Sure, there are saner voices right. and like-minded people, mm -hmm. um, but are we really penetrating the Indian public in a way that Modi's regime is? Right, uh, Sana, while I was listening to him, uh, one, I admire his courage, mm. and also uh, this 
uh, eternal belief uh, in optimism, right? Mm. Uh, I cannot. Uh, if I was sitting in that kind of circumstance, I Same. perhaps couldn't. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, my these days commenting on India, uh, given that I care a lot, mm. right? Um, it reminds me of a book. Uh, I don't know whether you have seen this movie called Ender's uh, War, right? Mm. Um, it is uh, written by Orson Scott uh, okay. uh, Card. And uh, he has written a follow-up also. It is called The Speaker of the Dead, uh, right. in which the job of the person, Speaker of the Dead, is to talk about the, uh, the things or individuals who have died to actually give them some kind of closure, right? Okay. So more and more, because it <laughs> hurts so badly, yeah. I feel that I'm like Speaker of the Dead, right? Uh, because today what happened, today is the second phase of UP election mm -hmm. and then there's Uttarakhand and Goa election also that took place. So um, I tuned in uh, early in the morning to see uh, Indian uh, channels and there's a channel called India Today. That in its infinite wisdom, I mean it has people, veterans like Sardeep Sardesai and others. But what happened was they decided because there is going to be a verdict on uh, uh, you know Karnataka which didn't come today by the way. Mm. So they sent an anchor to the street of Karnataka and there she st stands and she starts bad mouthing the six victim girls yeah. who, who are underage by the way and who are not being allowed to go into the school and that's why they have become pa petitioners. And she continues, and I'm, I'm talking not about Times Now, I'm not talking about their other so-called conservative uh, channels, uh, I'm talking about India Today, that there she actually disparages them and entire hour hmm. was spent in that and it's, my muscles started aching. I don't understand hate. And when it actually displays itself, I'm hmm. totally clueless. But that's the thing. How do you penetrate hate? When you can you I penetrate it with know. intellect, with death. sympathy? Uh, well, how do you look, do it? Look, uh, here's a problem. Uh, Isabel uh, Wilkerson has written a book called Cast, oh. the Origins of Our Discontent, right? Oh. And it, uh, she says that even in the West, even in the U.S., where you have this uh, minority issue, where you have the uh, blacks versus white issue, right? Racism. Mm. Even there, it is originally, uh, it stems, cruelty stems out of hate and because of casteism. Yeah. Right? Uh, so so in India, right. casteism is far bigger a problem and it is beginning, uh, getting bigger. And if you don't challenge it, it is going to reshape South Asia hmm. and the world and destroy it. Right. Uh, Faisal, Asana, let me just quickly yeah. welcome um, uh, in the debate, because we have our guest who's already joined us online, uh, Mr. Rashid Bagheria, who's an Iranian journalist. I hope I said your name correctly, sir. Thank you very much for joining us in the debate. I'll just quickly let Faisal finish his comment and come back to you. Yes, Asana, Faisal. addressing your question that who should be you know fixing all of this? Well, if we talk about the top leadership... Or how? Uh, yeah, b b only the top leadership of uh, any society can fix everything. And if we keep on seeing people like Modi, people like uh, Yogi, people like Amit Shah, you know, taking uh, the top positions of India, we shouldn't be expecting anything because we but know... isn't it the public also? It is public, but if, if, we, if, we, if we are living in an India, today's India is an India which is uh, the public constantly is buying the idea hmm. of Hindutva ideology. You know, if they keep on buying that, I'm talking about the majority, right, right, I'm talking let's, about the majority. Let's, let's quick, come back. Uh, you know, that's one, why they are bringing all of these people in the, very in the quick parliament. Answer. Our guest is waiting. Yes. One, I, I understand. One very qu quick answer. I think there are people like uh, Dr. Dayal and hmm. others who want, to see hope, who want to see hope, but I see a, a country of 1.3 billion people who have consciously turned their back mm. on people who actually want to do good for them. Mm. So True. I don't see any hope. No hopes. 
All right. On that note, let's move on to what is happening uh, within Pakistan and with reference to the interior minister's, <coughs> the, the Iranian interior minister's visit to the country, uh, where a lot of the issues have been discussed with regards to bilateral cooperation um, and issues of mutual concern to both the countries as well. Let me once again uh, welcome Mr. Uh, Farshid <coughs> Bagheria in the uh, in the debate. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we know that the Iranian uh, interior minister um, is here, of course, and many of the issues have been discussed. And something which is very very important uh, to both the countries is of course the border management um, and uh, for Pakistan specifically as well it's important for us that no territory is being used against the country um, and then of course uh, the prisoner swap and other issues uh, that are of concern to both Iran and Pakistan um, overall when we see the way that the countries um, have progressed in terms of their relationship and where we stand now in the evolving situation um, of uh, Afghanistan and the regime takeover by Taliban uh, moving forward, which areas do you think will be of utmost importance for Pakistan and Iran to immediately and urgently address for us to be able to take our relationship forward? Okay. First of all, thank you very much for your invitation to this program. And this is uh, your honor me. Uh, regarding the visit of uh, Iranian uh, Interior Minister Mr. Vaidi to Pakistan does not depend on the, the last attack in January because it's a different matter. We now we are facing a new order of the world. The, there is a lack of the United States here. There is another crisis between Ukraine and Russia, and uh, something. And this this uh, this crisis is pushing Russia to tie more and more with China. It means that something is taking shape right now in in, in the region. Uh, uh, maybe you remember that uh, in uh, some days ago. Uh, we, uh, Iran, China, and uh, Russia has a very, I mean, famous, uh, it's better to say famous drill in the uh, Oman Sea. It means that some, some, something is changing, changing of uh, switching of power in the, in the region. Okay. So for this reason, a new uh, government of Iran, Mr. Raisi, with his um, Minister of Interior, Mr. Wahidi, and they has new vision. And it's better to reevaluate uh, the relationship between Iran and Pakistan. And uh, despite of set aside uh, many common, uh, common for example, uh, culture, common religion, set aside, we have common enemy. We have common, uh, uh, it's better to say, uh, security and intelligence uh, issues right now. For example, uh, remember the, yesterday, Mr. Joe Biden, uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, plead uh, Afghan assist, uh, something about seven billion dollar. It means that if you if you won't give this amount of money uh, as an aid to to Afghanistan, you, it means that you will run uprising the terrorism attacks. It means uh, uh, uprising of poverty in the region. So this is the fact. Something is rising up, and Iran and Pakistan as two brother countries, better to say. I'm, I'm, uh, glad well, to what say does that this mean for Pakistan, country. this renewed commitment in actual uh, actions or changes? Right. What and difference Dr. is there? Uh, Dr. Baharia, uh, let me uh, uh, yeah. bring you back to the bilateral issues. Today, the government of Iran and Pakistan have decided to uh, form this working group to actually focus on mm. the uh, border fencing, on the Goldsmith line, yeah. so to speak, or the border. And then also to yeah. actually ensure that uh, the land of either country is not uh, used against mm -hmm. the other. Uh, do you think that yeah. this kind of consensus can hold and it will further strengthen the relationship? Because these are very testing times, sir, as you have pointed out, and perhaps cooperation is the only way forward. Yeah, exactly. 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 So, can I continue? Yes, sir. Please, but uh, you, I hope you will okay. answer this yeah. question as well. It is okay, thank you. Balance. So uh, the, uh, the fact I'm t uh, we have a very long border, and the border is not a matter of security uh, or intelligence. Border is a mutual and uh, interest. Mutual interest is not conflicting the national interest. We are not any cleavage here between uh, mutual interest or national interest. So uh, you know uh, the the population of the border is that they are family over there. They're family. And some, most of them are Pakistani or Iranian. And this is not a cleavage between, two, I mean, between two uh, uh, ancient country, I mean, uh, Pakistan uh, and Iran. So we have to profit from this kind of the common census. This is the fact. Mr. Vahidi has the background uh, as a soldier, you know. Uh, the, the, the new vision of this 
I mean, relationship is not depend on the soldier uh, look, but soldier look is deeper than the other. You know, soldier uh, 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 vision and reevaluating of the issues are different than the politicians. This is the fact. And I believe that with the new look, Iran and Pakistan will tie more than before. And all the, uh, I mean, uh, something like ter uh, terrorist, terrorism attack, and uh, uh, any any hazardous any hazardous issues in the border would be eliminated uh, Mr. Mr. so can soon. You, can you help me understand what's new about this new look that you keep referring to? The new look is uh, first of all I, I explained that we are the new subject. The new issue is lacking of United States. We are not alone here. We are ourselves here. This is the fact, and we we need a new look to this to this issue. So. You know, uh, many, many um, analysts uh, says that the uh, Mr. Trump also yesterday said that the I mean, the escape of America from Afghanistan gave courage to Russia to invade Ukraine. This, this is a very important sentence. It means that the lack of the, the lack of the United States can give another look to us. And we need we need a mod modern type, modern type of ties. For example, you, maybe you can you can control your borders with intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. There's no need for to send any soldier. New look means to use all power you have to to give welfare, to not give a security look to the border because the the, the place now we are talking about I mean the border something about 900 kilometers over there is not a, the base for the terrorism. It should be a base for agriculture. For, for, uh, for example, for uh, breeding animals or uh, tropical fruits. This is the, big, the, most, the, the, the most expensive soil of the world is there. You know, they, we have historical fact of this. Many, 1,000, 1,100 years before, I mean, the wheat of all countries derived from this, this uh, region. So we have a very, it, it's a treasure for us. I mean, I'm telling about the treasure. Now right. with New Look, we can profit from this treasure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mr. Bagarian, you've uh, mentioned that there is a lack of U.S., if I understood this right. Uh, but don't you think that uh, U.S. is, uh, uh, you know, presence in the Gulf, then if we talk about U.S. is uh, uh, presence in Indo-Pacific, you know, it's there. And if we look at India, the very India, the same India, uh, where uh, Iran is selling for 425,000 barrels a day crude oil to India yeah. and having uh, you know uh, very good relations with India and India being the front line uh, against China for US don't you think that it is still present and let me highlight once again that India is the same India from where someone called Mubarak Hussain Patel uh, you know Kalbushun Yadav he was carrying Mubarak Hussain Patel's passport and he was coming to Pakistan uh, from Iranian uh, soil and earlier you talked about uh, and rightly pointed out that uh, Balochistan on the both sides, of course, they have very good, uh, you know, family relations with each other. But still, it is a land that is under the jurisdiction of Iran. Don't you think that Iran needs to fix that? Actually, the fixing of the, I mean, the jurisdiction is different, different thing. Fixing the, the, the zone is not only uh, Iran responsibility. You know, we are talking about the families. We are, we have to prevent any uprising over there because, you know, because I, I'm not talking about that in, in the previous uh, government in Iran or maybe in Pakistan, uh, this, uh, this part of the board was forgotten. No, no. Uh, but the, 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 the importance level of the region was forgotten. Not the, not the place itself. Regarding the, your fir first question, you got, uh, American lack of uh, United States, I'm not talking about the air bases or military bases of America. For example, three days before, American sent uh, F-22 to uh, United Arab, uh, Arab Emirates. This is not the presence of the United States. Presence of the United States means the United States soldier and policy. I'm, I'm talking about the policy of the uh, United States. So the United States escaped from the Afghanistan, and this is the, the matter that uh, uh, Mr. Joe, President Joe Biden is challenging with the, with, the, with the Congress. This is the fact that we we have to profit from this presence. That is the fact. The policy, the new policy. So 
uh, you are talking about the India the, and the vast thing of in, the, India. India nowadays are trying to invest in the Central Asia. It means that along with China, along with Russia, along with Pakistan or maybe, maybe Iran, India is coming with us. And we can control both of us. We can control each other, even India. Okay. But it is part of Quad as well. It is one, and a couple of couple of uh, days I mean, ago, they were they were holding a you know very important meeting, and India was there. Yeah, India was there, of course, because India is the because India is the alternative of China for the United States. That's the fact. Right, Mr. Bahadia, when we see um, Iran and Pakistan's relationship going forward, um, of course, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the importance of not uh, of any territory not being used against Pakistan is of utmost importance to us. Um, with reference to what has been uh, uh, commented on from the Iranian side as well, uh, the sentiment is the same. Um, but how exactly or what steps can, can Iran take to ensure that for Pakistan? What is going to be the mechanism for this moving forward? A mechanism for the you know, anti anti terrorism uh, uh, behavior or something like that. I, I didn't hear it clearly. Yes, with reference to Pakistan, the terrorist attacks in Pakistan mm. and no other soil being used against the country. Yes. You know, uh, we are suffering from the same problem, and also we are enjoying from the same power. That is the fact. So if you if you change the balance of threat to balance of power, it means that you solve the problem. For this reason, Mr. Vahidi is over there, and this is uh, this is one day one day journey. Two, he a huge amount of problem is not solving in one day. It means that before this before, is the background of this. Uh, I mean, uh, journey. Uh, many many things thought fixed, and just it was a courtesy trip to I mean uh, Pakistan. It means that Pakistan and Iran are fixing the problems to to give welfare and re-evaluate the, uh, the look of to this region. It, I think in common, coming days, after uh, the, the, I mean, the rising the tension of the Ukraine and uh, uh, Russia, definitely we, we, we rising, uh, the tie between Iran and Pakistan, because of the, we are in the gateway of this Oman Sea, I mean, the ocean, according to the John James Scheimer, I mean, a theory of the uh, neorealism, uh, offensive neorealism, Definitely, the, the, the parties need the Oman Sea, and Oman Sea belong to us, especially and also the India. This is okay. the this is the tree, This is our territory, and the main the main uh, of this. I mean, how kind uh, cooperation or fact or whatsoever you name it is the Oman Sea. We are belong that, and now the world is knowing that that we are the master of Oman Sea. Mr. Fashid, let me ask you this. With, with reference to what is going on in the world, um, what um, is the overall take that Iran's foreign policy is taking and what are the major foreign policy concerns for Iran right now? By Iran or other... Uh, by Iran foreign Iran. policy, you mean? For Iran. Uh, uh, foreign policy of Iran or against Iran? For Iran. What is the most important foreign policy concern or challenge for Iran? Okay, uh, okay, okay. Sorry. You know, in previous um, government, especially uh, during Mr. Ahmadinejad and after that Mr. Rouhani, Mr. Ahmadinejad was far side, and uh, uh, maybe his favorite was uh, Venezuela and the Latin United America. For the Mr. Rouhani, is it was a little different because um, he was graduated from uh, the you know the Europe and. Uh, he was, uh, how can I say, Europe-oriented uh, uh, political. He has Europe-oriented political style. But now, according to our uh, uh, region leader, uh, says that your look must be over uh, east, not west. It means that the new order of Iran policy and foreign policy is neighborhood and neighborhood and east. That is the fact that Mr. Uh, uh, our uh, Minister of Interior is in Pakistan right now, because we changed our look. I mean, the, change, yeah. the main right. the mainstream of our policy is not changed right. because We're of, out of according time. to Last the Constitution. Question, yes. Yeah, the, Mr. Mr. Bagherian, uh, recently one of uh, the deputies of your Foreign Minister, he is seen saying to media that uh, you know uh, China must look towards Iran 
uh, and Chabahar rather than going towards Pakistan and CPAC because here we are, you know, uh, we, we, we have everything to, uh, to offer to China, whereas in Pakistan there is turbulence and everything. And earlier you were mentioning that we have the same problems. So would you disagree with your uh, deputy uh, foreign minister when he says that everything is okay uh, towards Iran side and, uh, you know, everything is bad on the Pakistan side? And if you could elaborate, what did he mean by saying that? What has he got in his mind? Uh, actually, you know, we have a very long-term uh, uh, agreement with China and, and um, the same agreement with uh, Russia. And uh, the parliament um, says that uh, till now we didn't receive any agreement for uh, approval. And it means that there is something, uh, something is happening regarding these agreements. It means that China will be an Iran partner for 20 years, according to this agreement. I haven't seen this agreement, I, I, it's better to confess. And also in the, uh, with, with the Russia. But it means that China, if, if suppose that this agreement is done already, and China with 400 uh, billion US dollar will be uh, our partner for uh, uh, 20 years. But you know, remember the uh, Mr. Trump uh, uh, says that, uh, all the um, I mean, sanctions against Iran, but he accepted the Chabahar port from the sanctions. It means that the Chabahar port is a very important port, it's a landmark for the, I mean, uh, deploying, for transporting, for uh, e even supporting the Afghanistan and Pakistan. Right. This is we're, the we're, we're out of time, Mr. Farshid Bahedia. Thank you very much for being with us on the debate. Okay. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, of course, this is an important visit uh, for Pakistan and Iran. But Farooq, can we really expect something good to come out uh, from this particular visit or would it be just another visit? Right. And I, after telling you in the first segment that I don't have that kind of hope for India, mm -hmm. I think I, I will end with the positive. Positive, on a positive right. note. And I think Iran and Pakistan's interests are mm. common. I think that since 1990s and onwards, there was some misunderstandings. Uh, but uh, during General Zia's time, even when we were part of the Afghan Jihad, and we were very close to one segment, uh, part of the Muslim world, Iran was a country that was never alienated, right? So we'll find a way to work around all the differences and mm. find solutions as well. And this is exclusive of how they actually have relationship with India. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that is important here is not allowing each other's the land to be Absolutely. used against the other. Of course, mm -hmm. that is critical. And on that note, we're going to end the debate. But we also are going to emphasize that we have a lot of concern for the people of India as well. And we have a lot of hope uh, for good things to come for them as well. Um, and even though it seems bleak, uh, we have a full faith and trust in the good in people and hopefully a lot of that is going to prevail. Thanks a lot for watching the debate. We'll see you tomorrow at 9.